One of the things I've learned from a quarter century living in Northern California is that not a lot of people actually make a living at what they studied in school. Case in point, our next guest, visual artist Kevin Louise Barton, who studied furniture design, and now you're a visual artist with a little translation on the side, correct? Yes, yes that's correct. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Now, I understand that, uh, like myself, you originally hailed from the South, but I don't hear any of that drawl. What happened? Uh, I think I left it probably in Mexico or Puerto Rico. <laughs> so tell us about how a nice boy from Marietta, Georgia, got here via Mexico and Puerto Rico. Well, I, um, I like the rest of my family, was never going to go to college. And mm -hmm. then after two years of working retail, I changed my mind. And I went to an urban university, uh, downtown Atlanta, and was studying graphic design. And I met a lot of people from a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So I actually started picking up foreign languages. And then I eventually changed my major from, d from uh, design to languages. And then my first trip was to Mexico to study, to study Spanish. Right. And so now you speak uh, and you work in uh, translation in Spanish and French and what other languages? Portuguese and Italian. Now, some of those have similarities. I mean, they're romance languages, but I mean, Portuguese, I've, you know, my, my husband who's Spanish describes it sometimes as Spanish on its side. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Italian, if you speak Spanish, you can help with, but French, right. all, all bets are off. That's not an easy one with those other three. It's funny, I always say that um, to me, when I read Italian, it's like taking the verbs in f or taking the words in French and conjugating them in Spanish and you get Italian. <laughs> yeah. So because I think because of the French that helps me with the Portuguese and the Italian combined with the Spanish because right. they're, they're so close. Now did you find you had a talent for this at a young age or was it something that you really had to work at? I mean for me I, I struggle with Spanish and uh -huh. I can speak to my in-laws when I visit them in Spain but I wouldn't say that studying is a great joy for me. Um, no, I actually really enjoyed it, and I seemed to retain information really, really easily. And when I was in college and my professors asked me what I wanted to do, I said, you know, translation interpretation. And they said, yeah, that usually isn't for somebody who's starting in college. So I just wanted to prove them wrong. And then within a few years, I was actually doing voiceovers in Spanish. So a lot of the uh, retailers if located in southwest United States, if you press two for Spanish, you got me. So can we still hear you, like, if we call a Lowe's or something? No, or, uh, no, not anymore. Yeah, but for a while. So, yeah, for a while, for a while yeah. Now, you, you said two words that I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, have gotten confused. The difference between interpretation and translation. What is the difference? So what is so the similarity? So translation is spoken. Uh -huh. um, that's when, you're, when two people are, are speaking and you have the interpreter is, is, um, is translating, but speaking. interpretation is spoken, yeah. Mm -hmm. And translation is written. Right. So. Now, have you ever been called upon to do interpretation, or is, is that just a different skill set? It's, it is a different skill set, but I have done quite a bit. Not really um, not um, technical, but like teacher-student conferences mm -hmm. when the parents couldn't communicate with the teachers, uh, doctor's visits, um, attorney right. uh, clients, right. things like that. So now, is most of it between English and one of these other languages you mentioned, or for instance, could you interpret or translate between Portuguese and French, or between English and Spanish? Um, the target language for me is always English, uh -huh. so I translate from the other four into English. Right. So um, we do a, a good deal of travel in Asia and China, and I'm sure that they make fun of things that the United States gets wrong with Chinese, but we have seen some just horrific examples of Chinese versions of American words, and I always right. wonder why wouldn't they hire someone professionally to do this? Are there certain things that don't translate emotionally between, say, French and English? Where I mean, the translation is correct. You've got right. the meaning right, but right. the nuance is completely wrong or embarrassing. I think that pretty much you, you're able to get the nuance no matter what the, you know, what the target language is. But usually what happens is people who aren't trained to translate the nuance, mm -hmm. they're, they're people who are doing just translation word to word, mm -hmm. um, they're not really looking for that. So a lot of times what happens is a company, because they have somebody who, you know, whose parents spoke Spanish, for example, mm -hmm. they'll say, here, translate this into Spanish for us. And you kind of get what you pay for. Since it was free, right. that's, you know. 
<laughs> right, right, right. Now, uh, you still work as a translator. I do, and, yeah. and I know that's very important to uh, your career, but also to your social life. I mean, it's led you to how many countries on how many continents? Uh, 27 countries on six continents. And I imagine this wasn't all for translation work. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I studied and uh, lived in Puerto Rico, uh, France, and Mexico, mm -hmm. and then all the rest has been pretty much for, um, for fun. And so that's your avocation. That's yeah. what you like to do. Yeah, yeah. Any other languages under your belt besides these four or five? No, that's... You don't think it. you're going to take on any more? I might. Yeah. <laughs> now, besides the, the translation work, I know that something that really I, I gather is the most important part of your career is mm -hmm. your artistic work. Right. Now, you went to school as a furniture designer, yeah. but you came out a visual artist. How did right. that happen? Um, well, it's funny. I, th I think that probably the best decision I made was to switch from graphic design way back in the beginning, my first degree, mm -hmm. um, to foreign languages because I think that had I followed that route, um, my artwork would be very kind of superficial. Mm -hmm. And all the experiences and the travels and, and studying art and, and observing art in so many countries have given me a really, really profound appreciation and also knowledge. So um, I think that... Um, what happened was I went kind of as a fun degree was the, was the furniture design. But when I finished, what I really decided was I wanted something that was less technical and more mm -hmm. expressive. Right, so in a sense, so, the, uh, the, the furniture design was science, and then you wanted the art. Right, right. And I mean, I, I was really influenced by kind of the whole Bauhaus movement where, you know, form and function are the same. It's not, you know, they're not separate. So um, what kind of what I came out with was I really enjoyed the technical, um, functional aspect of art, but it's also very constricting. So Right. So it was nice to draw a fantasy version of a piece of furniture, but then you're like, well, I can't possibly construct what I would like it to look like. Right, right. How did the furniture study impact your visual art? Because you describe yourself as an abstract expressionist. Yeah, yeah. I think because of the fact that... Um, Furniture design is very, very technical, mathematical. Um, you have to know all about physics so that, you know, when you create a chair, it, you know, it doesn't fall over or it supports the weight. Um, it's, it's very disciplined. It's almost like studying art in the military. Mm -hmm. And then I think for me, what I learned from that experience was it was good for the, for the disciplinary mm -hmm. aspect, but for it really... Um, kind of stunned me creatively. Right. So so did you get commissions for your furniture work or did you, once you got that degree, you went, you put the furniture making behind you, went right into visual arts? Yeah, I kind of probably uh, probably realized <laughs> maybe the next to last semester that that wasn't really something that I wanted to right. pursue. So, so, so there are Kevin Lewis Barton paintings out there, but there's no Kevin Lewis Barton chairs or... Uh, they're all in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so you made it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, what is the favorite subject for you to take on as, as a painter? Does it come from emotion? Does it come from experience? I think both. Um, my, my present body of work is um, monochromatic, all shades of black and white, grays. Hmm. And um, probably my biggest inspirations are jazz music and, uh, and film noir. And I think the reason is... I find that somebody who's creating abstract jazz, uh -huh. it it's, takes a lot more creativity and kind of um, to, to not really be following something, to be creating it as, as you're going along. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's extremely difficult. And then the whole idea of film noir where they weren't using special effects or color, it was just about the camera angles and you know shadows and silhouettes and things like right, that. Right, no color, so, just light. Exactly. So that's why I decided to focus my latest work just on kind of shape, shadow, form, mm -hmm. line, things uh -huh. like that, and remove the color element completely. So, And what after, once you get past this monochromatic phase, what do you think is, is next for you? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm kind of a in-the-moment kind of guy. Uh -huh. So I think that um, what I really like about abstract art is each piece is not really a picture in itself. Right. It's kind of a page from a novel. Right. <laughs> so I'm working presently on one chapter, and then 
see how that evolves into the next chapter. Great. So, we look forward to seeing what the next chapter is. Thanks. We've been speaking with artist Kevin Louise Barton. Next up, our conversation with author Susan Caslin and her new book about renegade priest Richard Purcell. We'll be right back. <laughs>